Look at all that money, yeah, the money that they spent. Take another look now and take some time for him. I know cut trees for paper, cause it hurts the environment. Stop deforestation, yeah, it's time for him. Oh, an acre of hemp makes 20 barrels of oil. To poison all our soil People got no food They got no clothes They got no rent When right now, it's time to Thank you for taking Time for Hemp. I'm your host, Casper Leach. You are listening to Time for Hemp at the timeforhemp.com website or on Tumblr, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Plus, and Lord knows how many other outlets that we are broadcasting through. And like a good joint, Time for Hemp is always best when shared with friends. Big thank you to KDK Distributors for being nice enough to give us a grant to keep us Loud, proud, and strong, and it is Tuesday. And on Tuesday, we celebrate all the amazing people up in Canada and their hard work that they've done over the years to help end prohibition. And uh, Kelly and I have a big surprise today on the program, on the joint show. I'll let Kelly uh, bring that surprise to the audience, but you're really going to be one of, uh, really excited about who today's guest is. So I'm going to hush my mouth and get on to the joint chat with Kelly and his joint buddy here on the joint broadcast. Don't forget, anytime you hear the word joint on time for him, nearly 2.5 million people all around the world pack their bongs, their pipes, their vaporizers, and of course, twist up a joint and take time for him. Kelly, hey, happy Tuesday. How's it going? Uh, it's, you know, Casper, every day is a great day. How are you doing today? Awesome. And, uh, I tell you, I'm excited about today's joint guest, so I'm going to shut up. I do have one question as soon as you uh, kick off the interview, but that's it. So I'm going to hush and let you roll with it. Right. Well, today we're we're lucky enough to have a, uh, a guest on who's been on the show previously, but hasn't been on the show for quite some time for more than one reason or another. So we're we're pretty happy to have him. Uh, our guest is Mark Emery. How you doing today, Mark? I'm feeling good. We finally got some rain in Vancouver. I, I've been home a year now since my time in U.S. federal prison, and it's hardly rained at all. It's the rainforest turned into Los Angeles while I was gone. So, um, and business is good. You know, the students are coming back uh, with rain here. People stay off the beach, and uh, you know, it's been a bit of a difficult transition as it is for every prisoner. But uh, I'm kind of in a groove right now, so I'm excited about uh, where we're going. Well, uh, before you all kick it off, I have just one question to ask you, Mark. I've got to know, as soon as you got out of federal prison, got back into Canada, what did you do? Did you did you go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac? Did you order a Domino's pizza? What? What? Tell me, what did you do? Well, people read my blogs when I was in prison, so I always was... Most a lot of my time was spent gathering up food because the prison food is very bad no matter what prison it is. Some were horrible, like one in Louisiana. I, I was aghast at what the prisoners had to eat every day. But um, I usually spent time getting inmates to steal vegetables and fruits from various parts of the prison so they could sell it to me. <laughs> and so when I got out, I was greeted by plates full of fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, as I recall, about four or five different food trays were at the press conference. Uh, I was let through. I was let out at Windsor, Ontario, and I was just unshackled right there in the Canadian immigration part. Unshackled around my belly. There was a chain around my belly. There was a chain around my hands. Chain around my feet. And I was like that for 15 hours up to that point, flying on Con Air and various vehicles across America from Louisiana before I was dropped off in Windsor. And then they just opened this door and out I went into this beautiful sunny day. I'll tell you, Windsor, Ontario never looked so good. And uh, at the time I was 177 pounds and I smoked uh, three puffs on a joint within an hour. And there was all this wonderful food for me. Now, let me tell you, I, I went, I ballooned to 192 pounds within three weeks. Wow. <laughs> and I was so kind of embarrassed about that. When I went to try to get clothes to buy, because I only had my prison clothes, 
I couldn't fit into anything and I was really quite getting obese and that really put the fear of something in me. So now I'm down to 153. I've lost 39 pounds since then. Wow. And 153 is my optimum weight. So I'm feeling good. I'm looking good. Uh, but it's taken about a year to get everything together. You know, just money matters, uh, adjusting. Jody was very independent for four and a half years. I mean, not only did she come and visit me 81 times, which took up uh, – five and a half months of her life visiting me and another five and a half months just traveling to see me in all that time. I mean, I was the most blessed prisoner in America when I have a wife who's going to visit me 81 times, a couple thousand miles each time. But, you know, when she got used to making decisions and running things on her own and I got back and I'm used to making decisions and running things. So we had a bit of a, a tense time there trying to decide who was going to do what and how we're going to make decisions and, and learning to readjust to me being in her home and in her presence all the time after a four and a half year absence. And I can only imagine how that must be for other prisoners who don't have as fortunate a circumstance as I do. Well, now I do have one other question and then Kelly, I'm going to pass it to you. The other question is we've often said, you know, Oh, you know, don't forget Mark Amory sending letters. Don't forget, you know, uh, the prisoners behind where I send them letters. Seven and a half thousand letters and you shouldn't have done that. And I'll tell you why. Well, no, well, the question I want to get to though is, um, we then we would say how how difficult it must be for someone like Mark and other members behind bars who are doing time for marijuana cases when just two blocks down the street or two miles down the road there's legal marijuana sales going on in dispensaries and and different states that must be a complete just difficult to contend with how no, did it that made me feel great actually you know people say well were you upset that you were imprisoned for selling seeds and prosecuted out of Washington State only to see Washington State legalized. And I said, no, that was the greatest day of my time in prison. The morning after when I could read in the newspapers at Colorado and Washington State, it was so important that it was two, not one, uh, legalized. And, and then Oregon barely lost that time too. And so I, that was my greatest day. All the inmates were coming up to me, congratulating me, and they knew something important had happened. And uh, no, that was, and not only that, in that campaign, Jody and John McKay, the man who prosecuted me as the district attorney for Western Washington, who later uh, became a legalization advocate and wrote the legislation for Prop 50, or Amendment 502, man, that was the best day of my life in prison when that happened. So I. I appreciated the irony, but I appreciated the progress uh, as well, and it was wonderful. And to this day, I have very few painful memories of prison because I was able to make good use of my time. I did get 7,500 letters sent to me. I wrote back to 2,000 of those people, but each letter would take me about 90 minutes. So I was in prison for 1,500, no, about 1,680 days. So that was like a little more than a, a letter I wrote every day. So I spent at least two hours a day writing to people. And I spent about two to three hours a day practicing bass guitar, which I learned in prison, and playing in my rock and roll band, an incredible band of incredibly talented musicians who took it upon themselves to teach me. I'd never picked up an instrument in my life. And uh, invite me into their band. And I tell you, music, along with all the lo people who love me and wrote me uh, letters, uh, kept you know kept me sane in prison my wife my music and all the love i got from people in america and canada and around the world uh, sustained me in my entire time there so i'm extremely grateful to all these people and i make a point when i meet them to show them how very grateful i am for all that and that i had a very serendipitous and uh meaningful experience in prison it's a very humbling thing and i was grateful for the treatment i got from prisoners from people who wrote me letters from people who put money in my account I i'm blessed beyond comprehension and uh, i'd like to think it's because of some of the things i did in the years previous to that and i'm, I'm grateful that people were able to respond to what i've done in my life yeah, you've definitely done a fair amount. Hey, let me tell you another thing, too. You know, there was one fellow, a guy named Len Preslesnik in Holland, Michigan. He wrote me a letter every day for four and a half years. That's like 1,600 or so letters. A letter every – and it wasn't just a letter. He would include photocopies of cartoons, of, of, of music biographies. He would go to the library every day and take a look at all the magazines and photocopy articles and photocopy cartoons out of newspapers, package it all up and send it to me. And this is a guy who lived on a disability. 
and yet probably spent at least $1,500 probably in postage to send me those letters every day for four and a half years. And when I say seven and a half thousand people wrote me, I don't include his thousand and a half letters. I, I mean, seven, seven and a half thousand different people wrote me. But that fellow was spectacular. And one day, since I can't visit him in America, I'm going to have to do something special for that guy because no one did more for me than, other than Jody in my time there. It was just amazing. And I, I must have read maybe 30 or 40 books from the excerpts he sent me from books he had photocopied in, in uh, his library sent to me. And I was so intrigued by them, I would have someone send me those books, which is the only thing you can get in prison, letters and books. So that, you know, people all over the world were so nice to me. And I'm very humbled by that. As, as no doubt, that's uh, awesome. Uh, people from around the world, where was your, uh, uh, some of the people from different countries around the world that you would maybe not think would uh, send letters? Well, I was able to give advice because at least with all that time, you know, I uh, the, the Daga couple from South Africa, Jules and Myrtle, who are going to the Constitutional Court in South Africa this fall, this October, um, to try and get marijuana legalized and uh, and kickstart their movement there. And I was delighted to be able to correspond with them. I was able to do email with people, too. And uh, so I was able to have email contacts. We don't have Internet in the U.S. federal prison system, but you, at $3 an hour, have a very primitive uh, monitored email service. But that was a, a godsend. Uh, if, if for an atheist to say that, that tells you how important it is. Uh, it was a godsend <laughs> that I was able to communicate with Jody through emails on a daily basis because you're only li you're limited to ten minutes of phone calls a day, and if you have a mother, father, children, a wife, and some friends, that ten minutes doesn't go very far. That's like one call to someone important every day of a very short duration. So email provided me with a, a wonderful opportunity to do interviews. Uh, to talk to activists around the world who are doing things, I mean, and correspond with them quickly. And uh, so I was kept abreast of all these different activities going on in places. But now that I've since been to Europe and see how much progress Spain is making and how much progress in Austria and uh, even the UK uh, and Ireland, I've spoken at all the universities in Ireland and uh, many in the UK, and I'm really pleased that there's progress going on in all sorts of places. That there is, but there is is also regression still uh, happening some places right here in your own France and Germany are going anywhere. France and Germany have slowed down. Belgium has gone back a bit. Holland is having a bit of a battle to keep what they've got. But overall, I would say the trend is still in the other direction. Those are temporary setbacks. But first, the most important thing is to convince the citizenry that – Ending prohibition is a valid idea and that pot people are essentially good people. And I think we've made that case. I think we're seeing that. I think medical marijuana and the tremendous amount of information that all of us have been exposed to in the last 20 years, of which I take some credit for, along with I'm sure Casper, you should too, and Kelly, with all the information we're spreading on social media and electronic media, we have won that battle. We have not lost people to prohibition. Prohibitionists have come over to us. And I think we have seen tens, if not hundreds of millions of new people come along and become activists and advocate. And if you remember, as I do, what it was like in 1990 when I started, before the Internet, before all this happened, there was nothing. I mean, in Canada alone in 1990, all books and magazines about marijuana were banned. All bongs and pipes were banned. There were no outlets selling them anymore. There was no medical marijuana. There was no industrial hemp. There was not political parties advocating legalization like we find in Canada today. And so the progress, really for a young person, they cannot possibly imagine what has happened in the last 25 years. Yeah, as we discussed once on the show, I sent you the uh, first case of Emperor Wears No Clothes from Jack's office when you ordered them way back in the... In 1999 or 90, I mean, oh, 91, no, I ordered them 91, 90, 90, 89 or 91. Yeah, or that's right. First, and, I, I, and I did that because I sponsored it. I had a radio show and I put on a Jello Biafra concert. Jello Biafra is the lead singer for the Dead Kennedys punk band in the 80s. And he was doing a spoken word tour. And his latest CD at the time from 89, 90 was called I Blow Minds for a Living. And he had a segment called Grow More Pop where he talked about this book at length called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Um, how about the hidden conspiracy, 
uh, that the U.S. government's waged to suppress cannabis information. And I was amazed. So I went to go buy that book and a bookstore actually told me it was banned in Canada. And I was a bookseller myself and did not realize that in Canada we were banning books. So that started my great crusade in 1990 to bring books and magazines right. into Canada. And you ordered five cases of Jack's books and all five cases came back from the border twice before we finally got them through. That's right. That's right. And they so I had a lineup a block and a half long the day I bought a newspaper ad just advertising that I had one banned book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, on sale to defy the law. I invited the police to come and charge me. And we sold out all, all those cases and we had to line up around the block. And then, But I didn't get charged. So I thought, well, then I'm going to up the ante. So I got every one of Ed Rosenthal's grow books. I got every back issue of High Times I could find. And so we eventually had like huge heaps of marijuana. And I was selling thousands of dollars of books a day. There was such a pent up demand in Canada. But I still couldn't get charged. It actually took four years before we got charged. And we were able to overturn that law. And my friend Umberto Ayrfida of Normal Canada uh, and uh, was giving out brochures in front of a high school, uh, just that classic one, uh, 10 questions and answers about marijuana every student, teacher, and parent should know. It's one of the old classic pamphlets we put out in the 90s uh, in the pre-internet era. And uh, we got charged giving that out to students by police. And so we went to court and uh, the court – fortunately said this is wrong, 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 and immediately overturned it and ordered it stricken from the criminal code. And so that made books and magazines legal at that point in July 1994. And then we slowly, which we got bongs and pipes uh, acceptable back again after being wiped out of the Canadian body politic for five, six years uh, due to laws passed. Do you know, for example, it's only a $2,000 fine to this day and always has been in the last 30 years to possess marijuana. But it's actually a $100,000 fine to actually tell the truth about marijuana in the form of a printed document or a video. And that's when I realized this isn't a war against marijuana. This is a war against the truth. And to this day, that is still the case. We are still fighting to have the truth accepted and our rights reestablished as a result of that truth. It's amazing that we've gone back that far, Mark. Sometimes, you know, like I say, I wake up, I feel like I'm only 28, and I was having problems getting getting my mind around when we first started doing this because it just seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, it doesn't seem like yesterday. If you've been to 34 prisons and jails as I have, well, all right, fine. I've been to quite feel like yesterday. All right, but forgive I'll me. Tell you this. <laughs> um, I've been imprisoned and jailed in nine out of ten provinces in Canada over pot, and many of the provinces, three or four or five prisons in each one. Um, I was jailed three months for just passing one joint in Saskatoon as recently as 2004. So, you know, when people talk about the crazy things that happen in America, yes, people do get sentenced ridiculously long. But it still happens in Canada. It can still happen in Canada. So our mission is still very clear. We still have a lot of work to do. But things are going in the right direction. And it's great that young people come in. You know, I, I tell you, I'm a very blessed man because I'm probably the only 57-year-old I know that's not in a Hollywood movie that has – just dozens of young teenage girls come in every day to say how awesome I am. And I'm thinking, well, I must have done something good if I can have that happen to me every day. And the, and the young people do know it because the great thing about social media is they can see there's five documentaries done about me so far. And I don't even know anybody in the whole world that has five documentaries done about them of any kind of trade, right? And I'm probably the only person in Canada that can say they made a living going to prison on principle. And young people see these films, you know, Citizen Mark and Prince of Pop being the most prominent, but there's three others. And the movies like The Union, boy, people still watch that movie, The Union, all the time. I meet people almost every day that said, I saw you in The Union. And that's a movie that kind of lives on. So, you know, I hope Adam feels great about that film because it's had a really major impact, I think, in, in changing minds and getting young people to pay attention to, to this issue. I would say it has, without a doubt. I know that it uh, it, it has for, for me. Um, you um, mentioned that you had been to 34 different prisons in the U.S. Are you no, serious? no, 34 in Canada and the U.S. 28 of them in Canada. Oh, 20, 28 of them in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I misunderstood. I thought, no, no, it was that, that's just totally I thought they were just moving you around, having, having crazy fun with you, moving you every day, trying to get you into every state or something. Yeah, no, I was in uh, Washington Maximum Security for my, sent my first six months. 
And then I was in a holdover warehouse in Nevada for a month. I visited the hub in Oklahoma three times uh, via Con Air. And uh, I was in Georgia, a privately owned immigrant prison owned by the Geo Group, a place I, I did detested um, in southeast Georgia, about as far away from Jody and Vancouver as you could possibly put me. And then finally, after bitching and complaining about all these bad prisons, they sent me to uh, Yazoo City, uh, a medium security prison run by the Bureau of Prisons in Mississippi. And I begged to stay there because that was properly run. I mean, no prison is a picnic, but compared to a privately owned immigrant prison, uh, it was a step up, let me tell you. Um, their music program was quite extraordinary. And uh, by the way, uh, something people do not know is that prisoners pay for everything in a prison. Uh, the taxpayer in the United States just only pays for the facility, the guards, and the really bad food. But essentially everything else from the televisions to what we watch on the televisions to pool tables to basketballs, basketball courts, uh, the, uh, the music program, the leather craft program, all these things are paid by the inmates when we use the commissary because all the profits from the commissary after paying for the labor um, go to pay for every one of the inmate programs. So, you know, when people see, uh, you know, pictures of me playing an uh, electric guitar in a soundproof studio, uh, it's important that people know that not only did in inmates build that studio, but they paid for it as well. The taxpayer doesn't pay for any of that stuff. So, um, and the inmates get like 12 cents an hour or something stupid like that too, don't they? When they work. Uh, I was paid about that, yes, 12 cents an hour. But, of course, I, had, I didn't care. I'm, I wasn't a particularly needy of the job. But I will say this. Immigrants line up and wait for a long time to get a, a job in one of those uh, Unicor factories, one of the prison factories. Um, you can ultimately make, uh, you know, if you're working a 40-hour week and, and overtime, you could probably make uh, 200 to $300 a month. Now, that is ridiculously low by the outside world, but I will tell you this, a lot of inmates over eight to ten years were able to save five to ten thousand dollars, which was very vital to them when they got out, because unlike me with a loving wife and, uh, you know, a, a public that appreciates my work from before that, most inmates don't come home to anything glorious or wonderful, and that money they earn in those factories is very important to them, so... Yes, the, the fact, and the, you know, the BOP still loses money running those factories at like a dollar an hour uh, per for wages, if, you know, type of thing. Or and so, well, not a dollar an hour. I guess if they're making two hundred, two hundred and fifty dollars. Sorry, that's a month though. So they're making uh, less than a dollar an hour, a dollar an hour, and over a period of a month, they greatly appreciate it. So, I'm of two minds. Yes, they pay slave labor wages, but at the same time, inmates can't wait to work for those factories because the time goes by quickly, and they need what little money they can get. And let's face it, their rent and food is paid for, so it's not quite the same as the real world. Wow, it's quite an operation. It's quite an industry, the prison industry. Between that and the for profit, for profit prisons. It, yeah, it's just uh, well the for profit prisons. The problem with them is they skimp on everything. There is no, there is not much good programming. Now, in fairness, things take time. You know, over time, uh, you know, all prisons tend to get better uh, because everybody's learning. The inmates are learning. The warden is learning. The guards are learning. Everybody wants to adjust. The only reason anyone's a guard in a federal prison in the United States is not because it's a great job that pays well. It's not. It's who, I wouldn't want to do that job. I don't know anybody who would want to do that job. But they work 25 years and they get a pension, and that's what they're all working for. So if you start at 22 years of age and put in 25 years as a guard, by 47 years of age, you're out with a pension that could go 40, 50 years. Now, that's not sustainable, but I can see the attraction because I'm sure they only get like, 18 to 22 dollars an hour being a prison guard um, and that's not great by any means but uh, it's enough to live on in those small communities they usually build prisons and secondly it's that pension they're waiting down the road for that's geared to inflation so it's a very attractive thing but most guards my point being just want to get through their eight hours with as little problem as possible so if you're not aggressive to them if you don't give them a hard time they have no need to give you a hard time because, you know, life is too unpleasant to do that and they want to go home and see their family and enjoy their life. And so I found that most people in the United States prison system, including the inmates, and there were so many people I met who were serving life in prison without parole for drugs. And yet they wanted to make the best of their time there and get through it 
with as little hassle for themselves and others as possible. I, I always really quite amazed by the integrity and character of many of the people I met in prisons, considering the circumstances. Well, well that's, that's cool. A statement. That having been said, I don't want to glamorize it because when you look at who was in my band, there was a guy who shot, you know, our singer. He shot a guy in the back seven times after a drug deal went bad or wow. somebody he was robbed, you know, of, of some drugs, shot someone. Um, Chief, a native guy who was, uh, played guitar with me, nice enough guy. All these guys were terrific to me the whole time I was there. Well, he killed a man in cold blood, and he was grateful just to have been convicted of second-degree murder. Because as he told me, he says, Mark, I said I'd kill him, and I did kill him, and it's first-degree murder, and they could have given me the death penalty. So I'm grateful to be serving out the rest of my life here. And, you know, so it goes. And my drummer, he got into a firefight with police as head of a cocaine conspiracy and got 27 years. So, you know, I, I wasn't surrounded by angels, but they were all really good to me in my time there. So, Well, it I'm, sounds like if you put together a CD, there won't be a tour. <laughs> well, I'm hoping actually one day we can all meet in the Caribbean or Europe. I'm not allowed to go to the United States, and they'll be barred from Canada. But we can all meet abroad someday, and they were also very talented. I'm hoping that that's possible one day. All right. Well, we're going to take a commercial break and pay our bills, and then we're going to come back and pick up where we left off here at Time for Hemp. Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. The only broadcasting network dedicated to ending the global war on drugs on iHeart Radio. THCF has offices all across the United States from Hawaii to Michigan. THCF Medical Clinics has helped approximately 150,000 patients obtain their medical marijuana permits to legally possess, grow, and use medical marijuana. If you have chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, or any other neurological degenerative disease, or if you have any gastrointestinal disorders such as GERD, irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have AIDS, cancer, spastic disorders, seizure disorders, or glaucoma, call us at 1-800-723-0188 or visit us online at hemp.org. Again, the number is 1-800-723-0188 and the site is hemp.org. Well, I went and had a bowl, good green reefer, big fat gold beef, mud, mud, sweet, or hide, don't hide it. Yeah, fire up right now. Be loud, be proud. Come out of the closet. Stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the foxhole in this war on drugs and help us to end prohibition. We are having an exciting joint chat with our joint friend Mark Emery here on the big joint broadcast with my joint host, Kelly Kristen and I. While I smoke a joint, he smokes a joint. Mark smokes a joint here in the joint about as many times as I can say joint in one damn sentence, y'all. So I'm going to pass this question question and answer back to the joint conversation with Kelly and you, Chad. You bet. Awesome. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time left in the show, and we, we do have a we very, very important election happening very, very soon in our country. And uh, I, I'm sure that a lot of people out there would would like to hear maybe, Mark, what you have to say about our upcoming wonderful election and your re-entry back into the voting uh, populace of Canada? Well, one thing I have to do in the next few days that I need a lot of other Canadians to do too is I've got to go register to vote. This is my first vote since I've been back from prison, so my current address and information aren't on file. And if I don't go register to vote, I won't get a vote. 
So that's something I've got to do, and I've got to encourage constantly others to be doing for our October 19th election here in Canada. Now, we have three political parties in opposition to the governing Conservatives, and uh, two of them want to legalize marijuana, the Green Party, but more importantly, the Liberal Party of Canada, whom I'm supporting because I believe they can form the government. Uh, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, the leader of the Liberal Party, is quite committed to legalization, as is the party, as are, as are all the candidates. Now, it won't work for every part of Canada. You know, in some places, uh, the New Democratic Party will be stronger, and they are advocating decriminalization. And and there's a few ridings where the Green Party is very strong on Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. So, you know, it's worth voting for the Green Party there. But I'll be supporting Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. I'm giving money to them. I'll, I'm advocating for them all the time. I'm certainly going to vote for them in my riding. And uh, it's really important that the people in Ohio and the people in Canada get out to vote for legalization. And, you know, our people don't show up to vote. That's a real tragedy. Uh, a lot of pot people get cynical saying, oh, they're all the same or what difference will it make? Well, you know, there's going to be a lot of ridings in Canada, a lot of electoral districts where the vote is going to be extremely close. And if you can get your friends and yourself to go vote, it might make all the difference in the world because there were at least 50 ridings in the last election that were won by under 1,000 votes. So we can make a huge difference and defeat this prohibitionist conservative government and elect uh, a combination of members of parliament who advocate either legalization or decriminalization. So if our people just show up, we are going to make this happen by this time next year. We'll have legal marijuana in Canada. So there's never been a more important election. It's never been on the ballot before. We've never had parties of the major kind advocating a, a pure legalization policy. So these are great times to go vote. These are great times to participate and volunteer for political parties in this election. And uh, I would urge all our people in Canada to get out and join a campaign to defeat the Conservatives, to get our friends out to vote, to get mom and dad, and especially grandma, who might tend to vote for the Conservatives, get the old people to try and vote Liberal or NDP or Green this time. Well, Mark, and one thing I don't understand, too, is I know you got a government there that does subsidy to help um, promote and advertise the hemp industry, the industrial hemp industry, and you got a huge industrial hemp. How come they're not getting behind this and making it happen? Well, anybody who works closely with the government. Remember, our hemp industry is still regulated. You just can't go buy any old seeds you want and plant them. You have to buy the government's regulated low THC seeds. Now, the interesting thing about that is our current law forbids all our hemp farmers from using the CBD that's produced in this hemp plant. So, you know, there's a couple of low THC hemp plants that have very high levels of, TA, or high levels of CBD. And we're talking, you know, tens of thousands of acres of cannabis being grown where these farmers are obligated to destroy the CBD resin that they produce, probably by the ton. And that's the biggest change we have to make in our hemp industry in Canada is we have to allow those farmers to sell that CBD because then hemp will finally be a really profitable crop even if it doesn't have THC. And uh, the CBD demands these days are just huge. No one can keep up with it. No one can produce enough CBD to meet the demand of all these people with MS, epilepsy, cancer, all these different things that they're finding CBD is so valuable for, we cannot keep up with the demand here in Canada. It's just not not there. And that is the fastest way I know to make it. Just with the stroke of a pen, we can legalize all these hemp farmers, and most of these hemp farmers are producing seeds, and so the seed bracts contain lots of resin, and that's all currently destroyed in harvesting the seeds, and they're not allowed to to sell it or uh, or, or or make you know market it as CBDs. A terrible tragedy that goes on every year in this country, and we've got to change that with this new government. So we have many different things we have to get done after this election uh, with our regulations as well as our laws. That's the huge. The CBD craze, as you know, uh, I'm I'm very familiar with it. Uh, people are looking for. Uh, strains that are high in CBD, uh, many people... Uh, Which don't really exist, actually. That's the thing. You have to decarboxylate uh, the THC to CBD. Um, there are, I mean, nobody was growing strains high in CBD like three years ago. So, you know, to all of a sudden produce high CBD strains, it's not really possible. Um, you can... Uh, collect and aggregate quantities of CBD so that there's more of it and therefore more potent. But that, that's just hard to do. There's not a lot of CBD being produced. It's not around and it'll take decades to get really good at it unless we use these hemp strains. Um, existing. I mean, I so um, are we still there? Yes, we are. It sounded like Kelly faded out for just a minute. 
Okay, Casper, I just want to point out to people in Canada that I'm not allowed to travel to the United States. I'm banned for life, which is truly one of the great regrets about my extradition is uh, closing Cannabis Culture magazine when I was going to prison and not being able to tour the United States and speak to our people. Um, but that notwithstanding, I'll be at the uh, Saskatchewan Harvest Cup uh, October 4, 5, and 6 in Saskatoon, Canada. And I'll be at the Karma Cup on October 16, 17, 18 in Toronto. Um, so if anybody wants to um, talk and meet and take photos and hang out, uh, I'll be at those two venues. And I'm every day at Cannabis Culture, Monday to Saturday anyway, here in Vancouver at our two stores, one on Davie Street now. We have a second location and our main flagship store for Cannabis Culture. And actually, Cannabis Culture is franchising. So you can expect to see Cannabis Culture outlets in other centers, Toronto, Hamilton, in the months and years ahead. There'll be uh, more Cannabis Cultures coming your way, wherever people are listening, including, and they'll see my face and likeness in places in Colorado very soon in a, a surprise uh, appearances uh, in shops all across North America. You'll see my face and name on dispensary. So a lot of exciting things happening for Jody and myself here and Cannabis Culture. And I hope people uh, make a point of saying hello whenever I'm in town. Well, that sounds really exciting. And it's wonderful to have you back on this side of the bars helping us to end prohibition. And it is so nice to know that uh, what what has uh, become your path in life has only made you stronger and happier and wealthier and wiser than anything else could have done. And we appreciate all the all the work that you and Jody do. Oh, and, we and I was so success. delighted when I came back that she's more beautiful, more prettier than ever. And I'm having such a fun time. And uh, All right, Mark. Well, we'll be having you back on the big broadcast sometime very soon. And uh, we're going to take a commercial break here and come back and pick up with Kelly Kristen and learn how to get a free vaporizer here at Time for Hemp. Listening to the Time for Hemp Global Broadcasting Network. Please share us with your friends. Serious Seeds is your source for quality cannabis and sativa seeds. Serious Seeds are the creators of legendary strains like AK-47, Bubblegum, Chronic Alley Mist, and White Russian. The AK-47 is probably the most avoided strain on the planet. The high THC content of AK-47 makes it the perfect medical strain for patients seeking quick pain relief. Cali Miss is an almost pure sativa. Female medical cannabis patients have reported that this strain helps relieve menstrual cramps. Sirius Seeds just acquired another Dutch high quality seed bank, Magus Genetics. From now on, Sirius Seeds can offer you even more award winning strains. The fine folks at Sirius Seeds strive to breed the best cannabis genetics that they can find, so patients can rely on the effectiveness of their medicine. Go to SiriusSeeds.com to grow your medicine. That site again is SiriusSeeds.com. <laughs> Prince of Wales is wealth and fame, great big ears and a big long name, but our Mark Henry takes the spot, the whole world knows he's the Prince of Pot, he's the Prince of Pot, he's the Prince of Pot, now shy he's not, he gives it all he's got, he's the Prince of Pot, the Queen of Soul and the Duke of Earl. Elvis Presley and his jungle girls The king of swing and all what not The whole world knows he's the prince of pot He's the prince of pot He's the prince of pot Now shy he's not He gives it all he's got He's the prince of pot Mark Henry and Michelle Rainey He's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. 
now shy. He's not. He gives it all he's got. He's a prince of pot. We need someone to fill the slot. To fight the cause with all they got. We found someone, so thanks a lot. The whole world knows he's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. Now shy, he's not. He gives it all he's got. He's the prince of pot. Mark Henry may go down south. He's got a brain and he uses his mouth. A little loud, so he got caught. The whole world knows he's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. Now shy, he's not. He gives it all he's got. He's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. I'm telling you now. He's the prince of pot. Better believe me when I say, no shy. He's not. He gives it all he's got. He's the prince of pot. He's the prince of pot. He is the Prince of Pot. We want to thank Mark Emery for being our joint guest here on the Big Joint Broadcast. It's really been a joy to hear his voice again coming through the airways. And he truly is fortunate to have an amazing spirit like Jody Emery at his side. And we send her our love as well. And uh, with that said, I want to direct our conversation back to our joint host here on the big joint broadcast. Because he and his joint team of people do something really nice that uh, so many people in the joint medical cannabis community jointly appreciate god how many times can i say joint in a damn sentence kelly (laughs) more than anyone i know (laughs) why don't you let people know about the uh, joint offer you and your joint team have (laughs) absolutely well as most of you know for quite some time we've offered a free vaporizer uh to medical patients uh, anywhere in the world we're not. Uh, we we have. Uh, we can send it anywhere you might be. So don't don't be shy. Let us know where you're at. Super simple. We're only looking for uh, people who use cannabis medicinally for whatever particular ailment you may have, and that you can't afford to purchase one because you're on some kind of silly disability or pension or veterans pay or something that uh, they somehow think you can live on and buy food and pay rent and all that kind of stuff and we know that it's not possible on the kind of money that they send you and um, we know that it's difficult to purchase your medicine so all we want to do is help make that possible Um, some of you don't like to uh, burn your cannabis and uh, vaping is a viable alternative Uh, that's a lot more healthy eliminates a lot of their carcinogens which are created by combustion And it's totally free. Yeah, I know. Free sounds like a crazy word. And it sort of is in a way. Sometimes when you hear, sometimes it's, it's, if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Well, that's not the case here. It is too good. Um, uh, You know, um, I know the uh, benefits of vaporization, not only in terms of eliminating some of the carcinogens, um, but the fact that it extends the life of the product for the patient. So for them, it's really, really, really a big plus because they have to spend less of their little or meager incomes on on uh, on their medicine. So it's uh, kind of like a double-edged sword. Uh, and so if you're listening out there, uh, please send me, you know, it's super simple. All you have to do is send me an email to kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdkwholesale.ca let us know a little bit about yourself and where we are you know where you are how we can get a get a hold of you and hopefully we can draw your name and send you out a a quality uh, free vaporizer and we list the names of the person who's been drawn in joint conversations uh, which is put together by Al Graham. I think Kelly forwarded that information of the last drawing and will continue to do so for all future drawings. And if you go to the homepage of timeforhemp.com on the left-hand column, you'll find a little play box where we feature some of our uh, past, like Willie Nelson and and uh, Tommy Chung's been on the network. And there's a, like a little five-minute MP3 you can download for free and share with your friends, pass around, 
in an email to people who might be interested in this offer and share it with your friends. So after hearing this, if you don't want to download and go through the whole show, which I don't know why not, Time for Hemp is a great show, <laughs> but you just want to make people aware of the offer itself. The offer itself, like I said, is available in MP3 format on the homepage. You can just download it, send it off in an email, and let people who know who need it know about it. So, Kelly, thank you so much on behalf of the marijuana movement, the cannabis medical marijuana movement for doing that. That rocks. Yeah, you bet. We have been busy at Time for Hemp. The website is nicely up to date, and we continue to grow. I like saying that. We continue to grow. And uh, I know you're going to be busy doing a few events up there this summer that's going to be pretty happening that people might be interested in. And you like to hang out at a few places to vape out, I think, that you might want to share with uh, our audience. So if they're in the uh, area that uh, you are in, they can drop in and say H-I-G-H. Yeah. <laughs> H-I-G-H. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Well, uh, as... as um Mark mentioned earlier he's going to be at the Prairie Cup uh, upcoming event uh, uh, in sa big old uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, I believe this is the fifth year. And uh, um, so it's, of course, bigger and better every year, like most events uh, become. They start out usually fairly small, and as, as it gains uh, reputation in years, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an awesome event. I highly recommend it to anybody. And certainly, if you're going to be in the Saskatoon area during the uh, early October, uh, the event is from the 2nd to the 4th, um, right in downtown, beautiful downtown Saskatoon. <laughs> so, uh, I'll be there, and uh, Mark will be there. So, uh, I don't know, Casper, will you be there? I'd like to be there, you know. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like a great place to hang out. I, I and, and you get to sample buds. Is that right? Like be a judge and go, ooh, this is Absolutely. great. Absolutely. This is a judge event. Yes, you bet. So, now, uh, what do you judge on? Do you judge on the aroma, the taste, oh, the everything. buzz, or what? First of all, the look. You know, you first get it. It's, it's difficult to judge when you're trying to judge so many varieties in such a short period of time. So realistically, it's like a it's like a marathon. You can't be, you got to be specific and you got to be quick and uh, you got to be fair because it's it's difficult once you've sampled several varieties to really ascertain if the variety you are now trying is really taking you anywhere else <laughs> because you're already there and not going any further. Um, anyhow, well, for the first thing is, is always the visual. You know, you always take a good look at it. Is it red? Got lots of hairs? Is it, you know, got brown? What, what, what's going on in there? And then, of course, is the aroma. The first time you open up the bag, stick your nose in there and get a big whiff of what's going on. So there's the visual, then there's the aroma. Then, of course, when you take it out, now you crumble it up. And I suggest, uh, not normally we use a grinder, of course, but I suggest your fingers because then you can smell your fingers and really get a heightened sense of the aroma of the butt. And then, of course, we load it up into a rolling paper. And then the first thing I do before I light it is take a good old inhale off of it, because this also helps give you a feeling of what it might taste like without combustion or in a vaporizer. So it gives you that little bit more flavor than you'd get if you just sparked it up right away. Then what's most important is when you spark it up, how does that thing burn? Does it run? Is it full of nutrient? And you go to pass it to your buddy, and he got to light it every time you pass it because it's so full of nutrient, it's crap. Or maybe it's smooth, and you see the resin collecting there on the paper as you slowly smoke it down. So, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a lot to it. you got to get in-depth, otherwise... Uh, Otherwise, you're just clowning around because uh, you can only, I don't know, for me, anyhow, I only seem to reach a certain point and then it doesn't really matter what more I smoke. It's not going to do anything for me. So all those aspects are very, very important because you don't know how long the high is and, you know, is this an up high or is this a down high? 
you know, unless you're smart enough, maybe you do your do all your sativas at once and uh, you're running around like crazy on Friday and, and then on Saturday you're doing all the indicas and you're on the couch and everybody's wondering, hey, that guy was buzzing around here like a bumblebee yesterday. Today he's like dead on the couch, man. What's going on? Oh, he's doing the indicas today. Oh, okay, I got it. So anyhow, well, it's it sounds a really, like really, really it. tough job and I know you've been there and you've partaken in these events and uh it sounds like that a judge should be given about four days really <laughs> to judge about 10 different buds so that you can like smoke it and really appreciate every aspect from first taste to getting over the buzz that it just gave you personally i'd like a full day with each of the ladies to uh, experience them and uh and give a true report my my morning my first morning doobie of the day or first vaporization of the day usually for me and then of course after lunch and then maybe in the afternoon and then <laughs> after work and right. then evening you know sort of get the full spectrum the all day effect the you know, first buzz of the day, the after the meals, uh, you know, it's all different. Well, so. some people medicate all day long and some people medicate once a week. I'm like you. I medicate on a regular basis and those people around me are grateful that I do because when I don't medicate, then they feel that they need to have about a, a smoke, a smoke about a half ounce of pot just to put up with me <laughs> if I'm not high. So mm -hmm. I guess if I'm not high, you need a half ounce just to hang out with me. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we're getting down to the, like the last four or five minutes of the big broadcast. So this gives you a chance to also give a shout out to another organization or event that you want to put a spotlight on. Well, the two biggest things coming up for us, of course, are, are the um, uh, federal provincial election. Um, you know, super, super important. Uh, like Mark said, if you're not registered as a voter, you need to get out there and register as a voter. Less than a uh, thousand votes in 50 or more ridings. I mean, that's got to, you know, uh, uh, got to, if that doesn't motivate you, I don't know, man. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. You know, to get out and vote. And then, of course, um, the Prairie Medicinal Harvest Cup. Uh, great event, uh, October 2nd through the 4th. You can just uh, uh, Google uh, Prairie Cup Saskatoon and the information will come up and we hope to see you there. I like that name to the Prairie Cup. It sounds so much like a, a year-end harvest event where you're going to climb on the back end with all the hay and pumpkins and just go for a ride and the, watch the stars and get high and listen to John Denver music. Smoking some good indica as you're cruising through the hemp fields. Right. Well, and maybe not the John Denver music, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't there with you on that one, but, hey, you know, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. Uh, Rocky Mountain High, what can I say? You know, I'm real. To me, that's the, that's the end of the year music. Well, that's what you usually want to listen to when you're dying, too, is John Denver, because after you listen to John Denver for two or three minutes, you want to die. So you don't mind, you know, really. So, <laughs> so with that said, I want to remind people that we heard, are heard all around the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are the only all cannabis, all the time broadcasting network on iHeartRadio. Now found on iTunes. Of course, we're in Google Plus, Tumblr, SoundCloud, huge following on, on uh, Twitter. So watch for our tweets. And become uh, one of our followers there. We keep you up with the marijuana movement as well. On Facebook, all the other social outlets so you can find us. And like a good joint, we are always best when shared with friends. <laughs> Yeah. 
Since 1990, over 9 million people have broken the rules and got arrested for pot. That's more than the population combined from Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, and even Vermont. Man, that sure seems like a lot. In 2005, over three quarter million American citizens got busted with weed. What burns holes in my tent is 86% were arrested for possession. But what I can't believe is one of those people was me. So what can we do about legalization? But rally around and reform legislation. But state our position and make it our mission. A change in the law is what we need. It's time we legalize weed. Chief Greenbud is spouting about prison overcrowding, using words like reform, rally, and change. Why should we do time for a victim less crime? Marijuana isn't evil, but it's taking the blame. Don't you think that it's time for a change? So what can we do about legalization? But rally around and reform legislation. But state our position and make it our mission. A change in the law is what we need. It's time we legalize weed Let's make it our mission State our position Change in the law Is what we need It's time we legalize weed Yeah, it's time we legalize weed and information see what all the buzz is all about it's time for hemp it's time for hemp 